Hello, everybody. I'm Noni Lamar, and we are here having a conversation about environmental justice today and its connection with other movements. So we are going, we have a few purposes for this conversation today. Our first purpose is to help people see how deep and layered the category of environmental justice is. And, you know, what is environmental justice? What does it entail? We're going to talk about those things. We're going to talk about what other movement organizations can do to impact environmental justice. And we're going to break down environmental justice for groups who might already be kind of overwhelmed with the issues they're working on. We're going to talk about what you can do. I've also asked that this conversation be really couched in the moment. Like, what are we dealing with right now as people, as humanity, as organizers, artists, um, all of those things? Like, what are we actually dealing with as people? What are the things on our hearts and minds? And how can we make this conversation really relevant to today and this moment of now? So hopefully that's relevant to all of you who are here. The first person I want to introduce is Shane Bernardo, and I'm going to ask Shane to introduce himself. Shane, just tell us who you are, what are your pronouns, and you know what organization you're from, and tell us a little bit about the work that you do. Justice issues, um, but my my work primarily is uh, reclaiming uh, ancestral land based traditions and um, transforming grief and transmuting that into power. So addressing ad addressing disparities of power within within the food system. Thanks so much, Shane. Next, we're going to have um, Jen Johns. Hello, world. Um, my name is Jennifer Johns. Um, I am a singer. I am an activist. Um, uh, and I am the founder and CEO of the Fun Manifesto. Uh, Fun stands for Free Now. And we are a sustainable ecosystem powered by art and culture. So my work is really about leveraging art for social change, um, both through the art itself, through the experience of um, bearing witness to art and practice um, and the healing impacts of art, but also leveraging that art, the stickiness of art and how it uh, brings us together. Um, I'm a longtime food justice activist and I know and believe that uh, when we leverage our culture, including food and how we get food and how we share food and how we prepare food, um, when we leverage our culture for social change, we have the best shot at changing the world. In fact, it's uh, guaranteed. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. This is a, a beautiful panel already. Thank you, Jen. And next we have Jamani Ashe. Peace, everyone. Really happy to be here joining you all today. Um, 
Yeah, I'm Jamani Ashe, and I go by any pronouns. Um, I'm currently on. skills training uh, for Black, Indigenous, and queer folks who are on the front lines of, yeah, climate crisis. And yeah, our work really meets at the intersections of building critical survival skills, um, rooting ourselves in ancestral remembrance, and re-Indigenizing our relationship to the land. And it's a blessing to be here with y'all today. Thank you so much, Jamani. And last, we're gonna have Brianna Hawkins. Hello, everyone. My name is Brianna Hawkins. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am from Inglewood, California. Um, I am founder of Fractal Strategies. We are a social impact organization that is really founded on the belief that we need each other. And we work with organizations, with artists, like Jen Johns, with social enterprises to really develop innovative solutions that can heal our community's most challenging issues. And the environment is at the, the crux of a lot of those issues. Um, our name, Fractal Strategies, is actually inspired by Adrienne Marie Brown, who talks a lot about fractals in her work on emergent strategy. Um, and how patterns that we see in the small scale in nature set patterns for the whole entire system. So even something as small as a shell, the pattern that we see there can set up is the same pattern that we see in our entire solar system. So what does that mean for us and the individual actions that we as people, as organizations, as communities can do for the whole entire system of you know our country and of our globe? Um, and that is deeply rooted in us. Uh, the foundation of the work that we do. So, so grateful for the opportunity to be able to connect with you all today um, and to talk about this important work. Thank you, Rihanna. So, so good to meet everybody. Oh, look, there we are all together. The ready bunch. So let's start with this question. So I think I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I'm an artist, okay? I like I, I work in a little bit of ecology, but I even had to Google what's environmental justice. I'm gonna tell you the truth. I Googled that, okay, before this this began. I won't say if it was today or another day. Let's just say that I Googled it because I've heard the term a lot, and you know we're supposed to define it here. But I like to kind of work in a way that. One of my favorite artists, activists, organizer, person, um, Bob Marley thought, which was say it so a child can understand, right? Like make it really simple. So let's just make it real plain on its face. What is environmental justice? If you were explaining this to my seven-year-old daughter, Amina, and she asked you, because she's going to ask a lot of questions, what are you going to tell her environmental justice is? Don't all jump in at once, but go ahead and just talk. You know, I really love the idea of explaining it to a seven-year-old because so frequently we talk about what, uh, we talk about environmental injustice. We talk about what's wrong. Uh, we don't talk about what's right or what's possible. And so I would tell a seven-year-old environmental justice is, um, is love. I would say that environmental justice is a healthy community. It is a place where all living beings have what they need to thrive. Mm -hmm. I would say that it's um, that that the experience of uh, living in a just ecosystem uh, means that people have access to food, clothing, shelter, safety, clean air, clean water, access to culturally relevant education, and each other, which currently means Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, that's what I would say. Environmental justice is. Mm, thank you. What about you, Brianna? 
Yeah, um, Jen, that was great. I love the the piece about love. I think it it connects to what I love to talk about, which is interconnectedness, not only between us as people, but also with the environment and, and other living things as well. That literally the survival of other species impacts the survival of me and then also, you know, my children years to come. Um, and when I think about environmental justice, I also think about the future. And I think about the fact that it's not just about um, us being able to thrive today, but us being able to thrive seven generations from now and what actions need to be taken place now to ensure that that happens for those who come after us. Definitely. Jamani, how would we put climate into this conversation if we're talking to this seven-year-old? Mm hmm. Yeah, I would say, yeah, just putting climate into this conversation looks like folks who are on the front lines, you know, of climate crisis, really having the skills and the resources and the community networks that we need uh, to be able to adapt um, to what is to come. You know, when I think of justice, I think of repair, you know, and justice requiring repair. Um, and what does it look like for reparations to communities whose quality of life, you know, has been negatively impacted by climate change, by environmental extraction and degradation? Um, repair for those who've, whose life expectancy has been shortened, you know, due to environmental greed. Um, I think about putting those who are directly impacted by climate change, climate crisis, um, at the forefront of these conversations that center what the solutions can be um, and what, yeah, what we imagine for future generations. I think about uplifting, you know, indigenous cultural and ecological knowledge um, from indigenous communities all over the world, you know, including ourselves, you know, the knowledge that has been passed down to us um, by our folks. I think about the returning of food and seed sovereignty and um, yeah, just just what does that repair look like um, in thinking about justice? What's seed sovereignty? Seed sovereignty. Seed sovereignty is, yeah, communities having access to their ancestral seeds, the seeds that you know, have contributed to the diets of their people for many generations, um, for those seeds to be organic, you know, for, for those seeds to not be contained with or contaminated with chemicals. Um, and yeah, for us to be able to put nutrition in our bodies, um, you know, that's really rooted in our ancestral diets. Thank you. Shane, I have a question around this idea of what is environmental justice coming from a place where you live in Detroit, right? So I'm always thinking of Detroit as a very industrial place, as a, as a place where, I mean, it's Motor City, right? So how does this, this concept of environmental justice play into a place like Detroit, Michigan? Thanks for that question. Um, that, that's a, a, a great question. Uh, I, I live in Southwest Detroit, adjacent to one of the most polluted uh, zip codes in the whole country, 48217. And um, there's a particular part of 48217 called Zug Island. So anyone that's been to Detroit knows this area. As you go over the I-75 overpass, you drive over what looks like um, if you've ever seen um, the ring, people often refer to this highly industrial area as the Eye of Sauron because there's um, gas um, turning into flames that you can see from miles away, um, PCBs and dioxins being um, flown into the air. And all of this, all of this in industrialism and pollution and manufacturing was built upon um, an indigenous burial site. And so 
this idea of environmental justice is rooted in the genocide of indigenous people of um, of the Americas and the enslavement of Africans who were who were fleeing the the South and came up here looking for jobs in the manufacturing industry and so on. And so we have to look in, in terms of uh, the connections between the environmental justice uh, movement and other movements is directly in line with all of those things. And so we have to, we, we can't just have like this um, intellectual conversation about environmental justice. We have to root it in history. We have to root it in the lived experience and we have to root it in place. And so as a diaspora person here um, in Wawiatanong, otherwise known as Detroit, uh, I have to look at the role that I play within this whole machine. Uh, so an environmental justice to me is like sitting with an elder of mine and listening to the lessons that I need to learn in order to live in right relationship with the ecology. Uh, a lot of this work is deeply personal to me. Um, back in 2010, um, I lost my father due to chronic health disease. And this was this, the same time of um, the period in which uh, the housing and foreclosure crisis was happening, uh, 2007 beyond. And 2010 was not just a year that my, my father became an ancestor, but um, our family also lost our home due to um, predatory lending and uh, the subprime mortgage crisis. And so between those two events um, that my family endured, I was able to connect the scale of speculation and the commodification of land and housing um, to chronic health disease and how pe a lot of people in the diaspora are caught up in this. And it's part of the legacy of settler colonialism in the Americas, but also back in my homeland in the Philippines. So there's a direct connection between the housing crisis, how we see um, um, the ecology and land as being private commodities to be traded and to be owned, and our the commodification of our health and our bodies in terms of chronic health disease. There's a direct connection between all of those things. And so environmental justice to me is the respirity of ourselves, um, reclaiming our relationship with the land, and there's a in in my people's animist beliefs in the Philippines, we uh, one of the central ideas is this idea of kapwa, and kapwa means um, in layman terms is a shared being. And so when we're when me and my people, and my family, and my ancestors were displaced off our ancestral land, and um, forced to uh, become wage labor and sell our our labor and our bodies we we lost we lost our connection to the the land and our ability to relate to the land and the ability, ability to celebrate our culture and so that has a psychic impact that has a physical impact and it's it's no wonder that a lot of people in the philippine diaspora are dealing with a lot of chronic health disease and that's part of the legacy of settled colonialism both here in the americas and back home so a lot of the, the a lot of the work that i try to do as a cultural organizer is reclaim these land-based practices as a way of reclaiming our spirit and healing our ancestors you said so much shane so much richness there you have me thinking about a lot of things one i just want to uplift this it within in the 2020 span, that's when I really started to expand my consciousness around um, not just organizing from a racial lens, but organizing from an, an ecology lens, really making art from an ecology lens. I started thinking about being in right relationship. That was the exact term. It's like, am I in right relationship with the earth? You know, I was always thinking about being in right relationship with the people around me. 
but I realized that the the earth itself is a being, right? The earth itself is alive and that she requires me to be in relationship to her, right? So I want to kind of talk about something you, you said a lot that really piqued my interest. But first, I want to kind of put up front in the, the beginning part of our conversation that there is a genocide currently taking place. And it had me really thinking about every morning I wake up and I pray for, I don't do a bunch of social media posting about this particular thing. I think I've done a little bit, but I spend a lot of time in prayer and I'm often praying for the dead, yes, but I'm praying for the living, right? I'm praying for those that are alive and that are breathing in this air, that are breathing in smoke. Um, those that are alive and that are living in environments that are very toxic, they don't have food, water, shelter, no place to use the bathroom, um, you know, all of those things. Like I'm, I've really been thinking a lot about how the environment is creating a trauma that will last generations um, for Palestinians. So I would really love if we can talk about the interconnectedness, as you talked, Shane, about all of these movements that we're a part of, right? Um, each of us has a different thing that we do. I'm, I'm assuming those are in the audience are not all in the environmental justice front, but how are we connected? Maybe someone that is here that is a peace activist, how is that connected to environmental justice? And whoever wants to speak. Well, I'll go. Um, I think it's important to remember that we've got multiple genocides going on right now. Um, that we've got a war in the Congo. We've got some, some big and real fighting in East Africa going on. Never mind um, the genocide that we experience in the United States. You know, the, the way that we're killing ourselves off um, uh, through violence, you know, police brutality or, or through the violence of uh, the way that we eat, the, the lack of access to real food. And so when we talk about like, how are we interconnected there's this, there's a weight and there's a heaviness that's very, very real. Um, there are lives that are, that are departing the planet in mass and, and we can feel it. You know what I mean? Like this is a different feeling than other times. I, I won't pretend that I, I don't feel the, the, the weight of um, the multiple genocides that are happening right now. What I will also say though, is that I'm inspired by the way that we are connected. Um, the way that our individual actions really can make a powerful, powerful change. And so we talk quite a lot about we want to cease fire. And so we want to uh, divest from companies that are benefiting from the violence and the wars that are happening. We're often not talking about how we're going to divest from the war that's happening in the Congo because it would mean that we would have to stop using these things. Right. And so um, we, we have to start, one, having a more holistic conversation um, and uh, a conversation that really deals with what's at the root. And what I believe is at the root is a fear that there is a lack. Um, I think that that's what colonization is built on overall, that there is a psycho-spiritual fear that there's not, not enough for all of us to thrive. Um, and that psycho-spiritual fear has us uh, desiring control over one another um, and a lack of a, a remembrance and an awareness that once we experience trauma without dealing with the healing factors that are necessary, um, that we are doomed to repeat. And so in many ways, we're watching that with Palestine and Israel, right? This is that it's a, a group of traumatized people and another group of traumatized people, you know, and that that is the the cycle that consistently happens over and over again. So how do we get at that cycle? And I think that we have to to invest in the abundance that's right in front of us. We need to open our eyes to the abundance that's with us right now. Each individual one of us has to. And so one of those ways is through food. We, you know, are many of us are blessed to eat multiple times a day. And many of us have the means to eat multiple times a day. 
and the way that we choose to just sustain our bodies day to day impacts all of the things that we're talking about. Because when we change the way that we experience our food, the way that we share our food, the way that we grow our food, we limit the dependence on other places. Number one, we, we create a social network that is not dependent on our phones um, and, and we heal ourselves. And so I think that we have so much agency that we don't tap into. Um, and I think it's super, super important that while we talk about the violence, while we talk about the um, separation from the land, that we see it as an opportunity to lean in um, and to heal and from that sustained and healthy places, individuals who are not currently experiencing an active genocide, that we're able to think more clearly and be a better support. That's, I guess that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jen. I think that's so powerful to, you know, number one, articulate the fact that the scarcity mindset is what's perpetuating the challenges that we're experiencing currently, but then also offer up the solutions about how we can use our resources and our dollars to be able to vote and uh, on a daily basis and and um, utilize them to, to, to shift how uh, exchanges and, and decisions are made. I think connected to this piece around scarcity mindset is othering. And, you know, the concept of, you know, saying that somebody else is different from me or trying to create that separation so that it's easier to be able to create as oppressive systems that create this winner takes all dynamic where somebody has to lose in order for me to gain. And, you know, even in the conflict in Gaza, the othering is clear where these folks who have literally lived next to each other for generations are now creating these lines of division that help to justify a, a, a horrific genocide that's happening. And uh, we also see it as a tactic of colonialism to be able to support infighting even within our own communities on the African continent and even here in the United States. And you know, the, the antidote to othering is, you know, belonging. And, and John Powell talks a lot about this at the Institute um, of Othering and Belonging. And I think a lot of times people are like, oh, belonging, that's soft stuff. That's a feeling, but the way that he talks about belonging is it's both a feeling, it's effectual, but it's also material. It's about having agency and being able to fully participate in the social, economic, and political systems that define how we live in this world. And that until you have that power, to be able to influence those things that you 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 don't really have belonging. You can be there, you can be represented, but you're, you 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 don't have that full belonging. So I think getting folks activated um, to to be able to inform decision making through policy, through advocacy, through community organizing is an incredible way to be able to uh, cultivate a feeling of belonging among communities and advocate for change. I am so inspired by the youth of this generation who are like, you know what, we are rejecting what you all are telling us about what to accept in regards to um, what's okay in, in, in war and conflict. And the fact that, that the youth have really uplifted the fact that this is not tolerable and the war crimes that are happening internationally. And it's literally changing as we speak, the way things are talked about in the political discourse, the way that the media is covering these issues um, is so powerful. And that's just using our voice and in recognizing our agency and being able to use our voice to uplift these issues. So I'm really inspired by that. I'll say another thing, as somebody who is trained in, in urban planning and, and development, I oftentimes like had this this consternation within myself around like how the built environment and how our ecology, the natural environment can work together. And I've been really inspired by models of collective ownership, you know, that reject the traditional capitalist it's only about me and what I own, but what can we own together or, or what can we nourish and support and steward together? And so some of the work that we've been supporting around community land trusts and other shared land ownership models, I think help to number one, cultivate that sense of belonging across pe people who may look different or society may tell them they're othered, but we know that, that we all belong. Um, and also support more ecologically friendly ways of being. Because through shared ownership, we have shared spaces, we are sharing resources, we don't, we're not just only accumulating 
accumulating things for ourselves, but for our broader community. And to talk about how it's a reclamation of our indigenous growing practices and, and development practices, that's something that has been really resonating with me that like development in and of itself is something that, you know, our cultures have been doing for generations as well. They just did it differently. They did it in concert with, with the environment and with community. And um, I got the opportunity to live in Mali for a month in West Africa in a village like um, about a few hours away from the capital in Bamako. And to just to be able to experience and literally sit in a, a space where we are living in concert with the land, where literally everything I ate I picked or we, you know, had some type of ceremonial um, uh, offering before we uh, ate the meat um, and that it was something that was communal. We literally had a big bowl and we were just all eating out of the same bowl together just to show our interconnectedness. I think it's, it's such a beautiful tradition and practice that I think we can continue to uplift and embody within our, our communities here um, as well. And so I just want to offer up, you, you know, uh, challenge challenging our understanding of ownership and thinking about it from a more collective standpoint and really cultivating belonging not only from a feeling but also from a material standpoint can be and can be some great ways to be able to uh, affect change. I just want to jump in real quick and then I would love to hear from you Jamani or Shane. Um, so for any of the artists in the building sometimes I feel like we get a little left out of the conversation we get pulled in when it's time to make the flyer you know, come time to do the poem. <laughs> time to write the song, but we're Bring not like, song when the sky is falling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not kind of at the beginning. And I've been working on this project, kind of dealing exactly with what you're talking about, Brianna, which is belonging and communities working together to share resources and build. What I saw a lot in movement, been in movement for over 20 years, is a lot of fractures, a lot of infighting, a lot of drama. Y'all all know, I don't even have to highlight it. We get it, right? And I wanted to make a blueprint for what does it look like when people are actually working together? When they got that big bowl and we all, we all cooked and we're all eating out of it and we each take our share, right? And then we all clean up <laughs> and then we all sleep in the very, you know, what does that look like? And when I said I wanted to do it, a lot of folks were like, you're not going to find too many people doing it. We found hundreds of communities around the world. That could be a, a group of skaters. That could be a group of people with a, a grocery co-op. That could be a group of a family that's doing a generational farm. Like, I just want to kind of uplift and encourage, like, even artists. For me, it's all about telling these stories. So you know, I had to learn how to plant food because I wanted to work with soil. So I was like, well, let me at least learn. And I called the farmer homie to the house. The farmer homie helped me hook it up, right? Very communal. I learned how to do that. But then also thinking with my artist brain, well, how can I document this? How can I podcast about this? How can I um, do film about it? How can I write poems about it? Like, how can I be a part of an environmental justice movement or an ecology movement or a climate justice movement from the mind of the artist without just, I really love, Jen, how your mind works that it's not doom and gloom because I'm not into the doom and gloom, but like, how can I uplift the possibility? How can I show, I've been really working on that with even in regard to the war, like I keep posting children happy, dancing, thriving in Palestine. I keep posting that resilience and that joy because to me, what we hold in our minds, right, is what we amplify and what we project into our future. So Jamani and Shane, did you all wanna chime in on this? Can I, can I say something real quick? Before? Of course. Um, I wanna point out that what you needed was right there. That, that what you needed for you to learn and to be a better you so that you could be better for your community was already present in your community, right? That, and that you have the agency to change your experience. And I think that this is why it's so important. Like what you said, what we think, you know, our thoughts become things. And so when we sit around 
you know, we see this a lot in our organizing bodies where like the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And in order to galvanize our community, we need to go and tell them that the sky is falling and then go fight the people who are holding up the sky. I don't know. Right. But what, but what you, and I think the thing, the power of being an artist is that we have sight to see that it's not that hard to love each other. Right. And if we're willing to be open and we're willing to be vulnerable, we have access to absolutely everything that we need to thrive. And it don't take fuck rocket science. <laughs> Excuse my language. I get a little passionate about this, but it don't take rocket science. It doesn't. It's not it's not wild to for you. You picked up the phone and you called the homie. Which, by the way, the homie had been telling me about regenerative agriculture and soil for about five years, and I have been ignoring the homie. Like, who cares? Like, <laughs> that has nothing to do with my work. I don't, do you see the police? Do you see what the police are doing? I got to shut them down. You know, like, I was not about that. And then finally, I looked over like, wait a minute, like, my bad. Like, can you run that back again about the regeneration thing, you know? And yeah. the connectivity of just that natural process to our community. Oh, the soil. What am I tending to? What is growing there, right? Your community is your soil. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. Yeah, I, I love that. Just, yeah, grounding in, in that love, you know, for all of life. I think a critical and a spiritual step for us all, right? It's just removing the separations between ourselves and the earth and understanding that, you know, our communities and the earth are being harmed by the same culprits, right? Settler colonialism, patriarchy, extraction, all forms of supremacy, including human supremacy, right? And really beginning to view the land, you know, our waters, our soils, our air, as kin, you know, as our homies, as our elders, as our solidarity partners in the fight against colonial extraction and displacement. You know, our waters, our air, our soil, like is sacred um, and our liberation is tied up together. So yeah, I think, I think a big part of it in a spiritual work, right? To restore that connection to our lands. You know, one of the core or tendencies of colonialism is that othering and separation and severance. And so for me, embracing a decolonial lens as it relates to the earth is really grounding in that interdependence, you know, across movements, across species, across generations. For sure, absolutely. Shane, did you want to say anything? Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm being so inspired by everyone's uh sharing. Uh and I, I feel very grateful uh to be here uh in this conversation. Um I found that our media environments are mirrors for the spiritual turmoil inside of us, and that we inherited that from our ancestors. And so um touching back on um the story, the very short story I shared earlier about um, my father succumbing to chronic health disease. Um, I, when in 2010, when he passed, I felt this overwhelming sense of grief, this, this love of grief I had never, ever felt before. And this grief, as I started to sit with it, felt older than my memory of him. And I found that this was my inheritance from my father to deal with this grief, that this, this longing to be held by the land, this longing to, to belong, as, um, as Brianna, you shared earlier. And so then as I started to sit with this grief, I found that the way that I was tending to land was also the way that I was taught to deal with grief, to push it down, to suppress it, to not feel it, to distract myself with material things, to 
disassociate. And in that dissociation, land and ecology and all the creatures became things, they became objects. So within that, within that journey, I had to reorientate myself, not just to land and to the ecology, I also had to re reorientate myself to grief. And in that, that process, I found that the reason why I felt that grief so heavily is because I had such an immense level of care and love for my father. And so that grief actually was very transformative because it allowed me to see how deeply I cared and loved for this person who shaped me. And so in that care and that love, I also began to see the land and the ecology as a caregiver, as a source of cultural power. And so since then, I committed myself to reclaim ancestral land-based practices and traditions as part of my healing practice, as part of healing my ancestors. That's, that's the legacy that was given to me. So since then, uh, I've been keeping a, a garden um, because when I was growing up, um, my dad would work really long hours and then he would come home and work in the garden until it was past dark. And I was like, wow, I, I really didn't understand it until became, I became an adult. But I saw what I was witnessing was him transmuting his grief into the land, into the soil. He wanted to belong. He wanted to reclaim his traditions. He wanted to reclaim his culture. And his relationship with the land meant so much to him that he would spend so much time in the garden, even after working a full day. So now as an as adult, I use this, I use growing and gardening and, and relating to the land as a liberatory practice of transmuting grief into the soil. And so the garden really is, um, symptomatic of a much deeper relationship that I have with my ancestors. And within that practice, I'm in uncovering embodied knowledge. I'm in uncovering ancestral wisdom. I'm uncovering intergenerational grief. I'm uncovering creativity that I hadn't previously been aware of that was always within myself. Um, I, I, can re, I can reproduce dishes from my childhood just be, without a recipe, just by working my hands and, and, and relating to the ingredients and the, and the foods. I can, re, I can re, reproduce all these different dishes of my culture without a recipe. And it, it's, it's because of this ongoing relationship with grief that I've been able to, to uncover and reclaim all this embodied and in ancestral knowledge. So this, this work of environmental justice is, is deeply personal and spiritual to me. And um, I, I see things like my garden uh, as an altar to commune with the ancestors and the spirits and to reclaim my relationship, my inheritance and my legacy of relating to the land and belonging to the land. Thank you, Jane. I just wanna take a pause. You have such like really potent medicine in your heart and the way that your heart is communicated through your voice. It's, it's really potent medicine. I just wanna lift it up in case you forget at any point that what you have to say carries so much value and I'm making notes. You're going to see beautiful art projects inspired <laughs> by things you said, like um, a special shout out to Shane at the end, you know, because the things that you're saying are, are bringing a lot of medicine to me personally, 
of when I get in those moments of grief and not knowing how to move through them, because I think there's even a romanticization, like a wrong, we're treating grief as if it's romantic lately. I see on social a lot, like it's very like, like we're slow dancing with it instead of allowing it to liberate us and move us through. And you're giving medicine of what to do with it, how it can transform, right? I wanted to to talk a little bit about, I think we have about uh, 10 more minutes. If you all had to pick one thing that was critical to the health and well-being of our people and you know, BIPOC community, let's let's say that as critical to our people. What would that one thing be? And how does that relate to the ecology or environmental justice movement? Culture. Um, I think, uh, Shane, when you were talking, it made me think of us like mushrooms. You know how when there's been devastation, like permaculture, right? Like, and then uh, somebody who's in permaculture might use mushrooms as a means to go in and um, eat up an oil spill or something like that. And when it's all said and done, those mushrooms are somehow still edible, right? Like there's a way that, um, that our, our cultural awareness of ourselves is the most important thing, that we are enough. Um, and that uh, I believe it, much of what Shane is talking about is the most important thing for us as, as a BIPOC community is to remember how valuable we are to ourselves. Um, and from there gives us the, the confidence to lean into that agency um, and, uh, and to touch those other wisdoms that are just living inside of us rent free, right? Like you said, you can go and recreate whole recipes from your childhood without any knowledge of how it came to be because it lives inside of you. But there's a value that you've put on being present with yourself and hearing the divine through you and allowing your ancestors to speak through you through this age old practice of, of gardening. And so I think that for me, it's a psycho-spiritual shift in a self-awareness. Um, you can't expect someone else to tell you that you belong before you know that you belong. Jamani, Brianna, the one thing that you feel is critical to the health and well-being of our of our people, of our communities, and its relationship to the environmental justice movement. Yeah, um, I mean, no one is free until all of us are free, you know, to to bring in Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, there's little to no separation between our liberation movements, right? And, you know, we can pass all the new Green Deal policies we want, but there's no ecological justice in a world where, you know, Congolese people are murdered and their secret lands are desecrated so we could have cell phones. You know, there's no ecological justice in a world where Palestinians and their lands and waters and airs, you know, are contaminated by chemical weapons. Um, and so it's important to, yeah, just build across movements, you know, and, and just understand the value in understanding that all of our fights for liberation are so deeply and intrinsically linked together. Yeah, that's beautiful, Jamani. Um, I think to build off of that and what's been so inspiring about this conversation um, is the focus on just radical imagination and innovative solutions. I, I, I'm, the reason why I even work with my partner to create fractal strategies is because I've been so tired of the same regular, regular, tried, 
boring solutions that are really built into the oppressive systems that created our issues in the first place. And so I'm really inspired by the opportunity to be able to think outside of the box and utilize solutions that um, are rooted in reclaiming our indigenous cultural practices um, and also just creativity. And I found that when we work together and actually when we look at the inter intersection of different fields, different paradigms of knowledge, that's where we get the most creative and innovative solutions. So bringing in artists, you know, talking about this from a public health perspective, bringing in com you know, community development folks, and, as well as social and political activists, that is the sweet spot for where the magic around uh, in innovation um, is created. And so I, I think imagination is so critical to this because we can't keep doing the same things and expecting d different results. Shane, thank you, Brianna. Great. <clears throat> One thing that I uh, learned from um, in the in the wake of COVID, I, I know we're still dealing with the pandemic uh, in, in some level. One one thing I was really inspired by is how uh, communities came together, came together and and created circles of care, um, and how we potted up and created um, mutual aid efforts. Um, one of the sicknesses that um, is parallel to chronic health disease is hyper individualism. And uh, my family lived this firsthand um, in the city of uh, Detroit, which is a, a majority black city. And cities like Detroit in the manufacturing belt um, that are majority black and brown and immigrant um, were devastated by the subprime mortgage crisis because these are cities that help create the middle class. And so places like Detroit was known not just for the middle class, the creation of middle class, but also um, for the highest concentration of black home ownership in the whole country. And the reason why we're devastated is because the risk of maintaining single family housing was spread across the whole city. So when the subprime mortgage crisis hit, it leveled the city like an economic devastation. We live, we have lived through here in Detroit, we had the um, the largest municipal bankruptcy in the whole country. And that in part was done by through speculation and predatory lending. And we see the same tactics being used in places like Puerto Rico, in, in Gaza. When you can turn off lights, food, water, communications to a city that houses 2 million people, there's something wrong with that picture. The, the, so the, the, same, the, same, the same predatory settler colonial practices that have been used here in the Americas have been exported around the world. So it, this, this, what we're living through is by design. We're seeing a historic pattern of abusive practices, oppressive practices around the world. And so the way that we combat that is by spreading the risk amongst ourselves and looking at the ways that we depend on the system to provide for our own basic needs, that we need to create mutual aid efforts that meet our basic needs. And the less that we depend on the system to meet our basic needs, the more powerful we are as a people the way that we can leverage our collective power, we're unstoppable. So I, I would like to see us um, address hyper-individualism. I would like us to address competition. And I would like us to address the commodification of our labor and land. And um, people in Detroit that are striking against the big three, against a Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, uh, against the casinos here, I'm with you 100%. Because I see how the the fight for labor is also a fight for for sovereignty. So we need to own our labor. We need to create mutual aid networks. We need to to fend for ourselves and withdraw our our dependence upon a system that oppresses us. Thank you so much. I'd love to talk about um, we have we haven't really 
talked a little bit about this, but I want to talk about the role of technology. I think like we're like quickly speeding toward a future that is incredibly unknown and uncertain. Um, yeah, I have no idea what it's going to look like. I don't know if we're going to all have like little robot babies that we are raising <laughs> in 10 years. I, I have no idea. I don't know if there's going to be like, we all drive electric vehicles that someone could turn on and off with a switch. I have a lot of paranoias, obviously, but I'm so curious about like, how does how does the environmental justice movement interact with technology? They feel very uh, like, like enemies in my mind, like the environment and technology, but perhaps I'm wrong. And I see Jen is saying you're wrong. <laughs> They're not enemies. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think that we have every reason as, as people of color to be afraid of what's happening with the development of AI you know, anything that, that has surveilled us in the past has absolutely screwed us over. And so it is it is frightening, but I think not but, and it's important that we walk into it. Um, right now we're in what's called machine learning and the machines are learning fast. And if we do not engage in the conversation, if we're not a part of uh, a tech conversation in a grand and big and inspired and joyful way, then um, we will be oppressed. We will not be seen as human. We will be mined, right? And so I think that right now is a really critical time for us to engage in uh, technology. And that's definitely what my company, The Fund Manifesto, is engaging in. We're creating pathways and leveraging the technology to connect us to the resources that we need in order to make better decisions. There's a, a statistic out there that says that um, something like 78% of consumers would like to know that they're making an investment towards a better environment when they spend their money. And that jumps to 80 some odd percent when we talk about uh, consumers that are between the ages of 18 and 35. Um, and, but they often don't know how to find that information. Um, and so we can leverage the technology to make the world smaller. We can leverage the technology to bolster our local economies so that we're better global citizens. Um, and that is the whole function of the Fun Manifesto. Fun is a sustainable ecosystem powered by art and culture. And a lot of the ways that we're engaging and connecting with art and culture is through our technology. You know, through the through the pandemic, we saw our technology keep us together and in many ways help to keep us sane. And so I think that it's important that we uh, are present to our concerns, that we don't pretend like the counterintelligence program didn't happen or better yet that it doesn't continue to exist. That's a very real, real thing. Um, and I think that it is our business as people who want to see a world where all living beings have what they need to thrive, that we activate and engage with the technology such that we're telling the technology that we deserve to live and not just deserve to live, but that we demand that we live and we demand that the technology make it more possible for us to live. Um, and when people of color engage in that technology, when we start putting our hands in it and we say, this is what it's going to be and we have control over it, which right now we do. We have the opportunity to engage in that way. When we do that, all boats rise, right? When when you deal with historically oppressed people, you deal with people who are, are creating children with their bodies and so forth. There is a way that we are thinking about the whole differently than um, than other folks might. And so I think it's a really exciting time with technology, actually. I think that we have a huge opportunity. And if and and because we can choose it right now, I won't I won't speak negatively, because we are choosing it right now, we are going to see the fruits of that in the very near future. Um, because we are thriving. This is not the end times. This is the beginning of something truly beautiful where all living beings have what they need to thrive. And our machines are integral to that. They are a physical manifestation of our deepest desires. Thank you for that perspective. Very expansive and hopeful. I'm going to go to Jamani. I would love to know what you your perspective is 
I'd love to talk to about, if you don't mind, like addressing some of the things that how technology interacts with climate, right? When I'm thinking about, we were talking about earlier about the Congo, about, I believe it's like the cobalt, like those things that not only um, power our phones, but our, these electric vehicles, like we're, we're having this big jump into the electric and I get some of my closest friends work in the energy space, right? And I'm always kind of having conversations about is electric really better for our climate or is it also harmful for human beings or like, you know, there's just so much to kind of just the transportation of it all. Right. And the daily usage of some, something's got to power the AI. So (laughs) I'm really curious about what you think. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. I mean, I, I think we have to acknowledge that, you know, modern technology, you know, machine technology as we know it today is rooted in an extractive economy, you know, that does pollute the environment, that does pollute our waterways. Um, and and there's lives at stake, you know, like as this extraction is ongoing. Um, in our work at Sankofa Roots, we really challenge folks to think more expansively about technology, right? Like, what are the traditional ancestral technologies, you know, that have always been with our people for growing food, you know, for catching fish, um, you know, earth-based technologies, um, the spiritual technologies, you know, that our, our folks practice for dealing with grief and bringing ceremony into space. Um, and so not, not necessarily, you um, choosing to be left behind in that realm, but knowing that, yeah, technology is is more expansive, right, than electronics. Um, And what does it look like to really embrace that um, and to return to the land in that light? I love that. Thank you. I love this conversation. This conversation is so anti doom and gloom. I wanted you to come with some of them statistics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask a doom and gloom question next. Just get everybody get ready. Okay. That's the next <laughs> one. We got to get some a reality check. This is environmental justice. <laughs> Brianna, what do you think? Um, I, I think that you're right. There's two sides to the coin. Um, I have a friend who he his name is Emmanuel Johnson. He um, is one of very few Black PhDs in um, artificial intelligence, and I've been talking to him about this question about like is technology going to hurt us or save us? And he's like, honestly, technology in and of itself is not harmful. He was like, technology plus capitalism is what creates the harm. He was like, in AI, they've been doing this work for decades. It's only until the corporations got a hold of it and figured out ways to monetize it in ways that would be exploitive of people, of resources, et cetera, that it has now become, you know, an issue of concern and harm. But his work is all about trying to rectify social ills using technology, incorporating AI in the K through 12 classrooms and other spaces. So I do think that there's an opportunity um, if done with through ethics to be able to actually leverage technology to kind of expedite, you know, repair from a lot of the harm that has been caused by capitalism. Um, but he said he was at a conference, an AI conference in Tokyo. It was like thousands of people there. He was like, he was one of four Black people there at the table talking about it and making decisions on how you, things can be used. And so to uh, Jen's point about us being a part of those decisions, I think it's really important because the reality is decisions are being made. And if we're not at the table, they're being made without us. Um, But I also have this interesting reflection, you know, during COVID, I live in Los Angeles, you know, it's one of the small capitals of of the, the country. And during COVID, when we were all required to be inside and just, you know, sit, sit down for a little bit, how clear the air was, you know, how just a happy nature seemed and just how beautiful our environment was. And so I'm also like, do we need to do something or do we actually just need to do less, you know, just sit down a little bit and like let the earth kind of repair itself. And so I'm still really curious about what those solutions look like. 
Um, but I, I do see the complexities and I think at the root of it, it's when, um, when we've been saying this all day, extractive capitalism and extractive economics intersect with these things that, that that's what really causes the harm. Thank you so much, Brianna. What you said actually made me think about like my early days of organizing were with the bus riders union, my exposure to the strategy center here in Los Angeles and the BRU and just these ideas that it's a lot of the things we're talking about, right? It was a, yes, you can live communally. Like you can, you can train transport yourself communally when we're really thinking about like the harm that vehicles do whether that be electric or gas right like what if we were in a public transportation system here in Los Angeles that was actually effective we would have the kind of environment I remember those wonderful COVID like like it was almost like snow white <laughs> like there, the birds were chirping the little the blue skies, you know, somebody was singing outside, you didn't know where it was coming from. But you know, it was really wonderful. And I, I think if we start thinking more from that communal lens, that indigenous lens, right? A lot of these things, I, I do have to agree, it really is capitalism that's the problem, not the usage of technology. Shane, did you want to weigh in? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm I'm with you. Uh, I'm with Jamani uh, on this one. Um, that technology is so much more expansive. A lot of our quote unquote tech comes from the aerospace industry and from the military, and then the and then it gets repurposed in um, the for consumer goods and services. Uh, how effed up is that? In 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 terms of like social media. <laughs> Our algorithms are designed to manipulate anxiety and fear. And that's how we come across like things like doom scrolling, because we're attempting to um, cope in, in a way. Uh, but unfortunately, the convenience of social media has taken the place of our ability to um, our ability to relate to grief in a healthy way and our ability to uh, resolve conflict in a healthy way. And so tech, um, a form of technology which is really helpful is conflict resolution. What are, what are ancestral and cultural practices around that? How do we practice those things? Those are forms of technology. Oral tradition, that's a form of technology. Growing food, that's a form of technology. A hug can be a form of technology. How we, how we know how to embrace one another and co-regulate our nervous systems, that's a technology. And so we need, we need to look beyond um, these convenient ways that make it easier for us to consume or to be more efficient workers. We need to look at technology outside of those realms. Um, um, before the pandemic, uh, of, of, um, Detroit hosted this uh, conference called the New Work Conference, and um, one of the, one of the elders and teachers in Detroit, Bob Wing uh, Curtis, who's the co-founder of Freedom Freedom Farms, he said, uh, "You will never see a bird holding a sign will work for food." And, and so, this idea about technology is directly related to our idea of work. What is the work? What work is synonymous with our species that help us self-actualize and help us become the fullest versions of ourselves? Not the most productive workers, not the best consumers, um, <laughs> this and that. What, what work or what technology helps us become more of who we are to help us self-actualize, to, to express our fullest selves? That is the technology that I'm interested in, the technology to help us coalesce and, and build healthy relationships with one another, not to manipulate us into anxious, uh, fearful beings that do scroll on, the, on, on social media all day. We, uh, we need to really flip this idea of technology on its head and think about um, ancestral and cultural ways that are rooted in our traditions of relating to one another. That That is technology. Mm. Mm. 
that was that was that was it, right? Y'all feeling it? I'm gonna tell a little story based on what you just said. Um, I have a I don't have a dishwasher. Let's start with that. I don't have that technology in this home. Um, I wish I did. There's no place to put one, or else I would have had one. Okay, there's six of us here, and so I've been able to see a lot of these birds uh, making nests around our home throughout the time I've lived in this home. But recently, some months back, um, I watched a bird. This is, to me, the, the, the theme of this is nature as technology, studying it, right? Um, I watched this bird make a nest. I watched, I watched the little mama bird put each little twig, because every day I'm there, I'm washing them dishes, I'm cooking them, I'm cooking them dishes, I'm washing them dishes. I watched her do it, then I watched her lay the eggs, then I watched her sit on them, <laughs> then I watched them hatch, okay? Then I watched her feed each bird. It was really interesting to me, like this idea that yes, nature does not ask bird, the, the, the each little bird was really interesting, like the loudest one would get fed first and the quietest one would get fed last, but the, the loudest one would fly out first. And it was like the people that needed the people. See, I like made them like humans. <laughs> the beings that needed the most care spent the most time in the nest because they were fed last. And she would go back and forth and back and forth every 20 minutes or so to get a little seed and put it in there. And I just really started learning how to be a better parent um, just by watching this bird and, and her young. I started learning how to manage my team better, how to listen not only listen to the loudest voice, but listen to the quiet voices, but also sometimes the loudest voice needs to get fed so they, they can go ahead and go, right? Like, go ahead, here you go, so you can depart. And I think oftentimes when we're talking about environmental justice, we're not, and what I love about this conversation is we're not actually talking about nature itself. Nature itself is a great teacher. The soil itself, when I look at, you know, they say you look into the teaspoon of soil and it's like has billions of microorganisms, like the diversity of soil. Even in this conversation, it's a diversity of thought. We all supposedly come from a similar background in some way, but we're so complex, so different. And the diversity of thought allows for us to elevate, to expand, right? So I hope y'all are ready for your, this is your doom, doom and gloom question. Don't try to spin it to a positive. Because <laughs> every single one of y'all is spin these questions positive. So what is at stake? You know what that means, right? What's at stake? What are we going to lose? What's going to be horrible, awful? What is at stake? If we, the broader social justice movement, don't center environmental justice in our work. What is at stake? If we don't center environmental justice, what will happen to us? What we're dealing with right now. <laughs> Wildness, <laughs> war. Am I allowed to cuss on here? Like, is somebody gonna be mad at me? Um, like, I don't really know about the cussing, but you gotta be authentic. Does nature cuss? Yeah. Listen, we're dealing with wild fuckery right now. So we're already not centering environmental justice. And I think a lot of it is, is that we're talking about justice. There's a there's a, 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 a still a system of um a system around it. It's not expansive enough. And so what's at stake is everything, because we're not looking at um a, an ecosystem, a sustainable ecosystem, our language around it, our ideas around it are are so lack based and um as a result everything is kind of fucked up like we we're not we're not centering our interdependence with all things living and as a result things are dying so i think you know what will happen more more what what will happen is parable of the sower which is happening you know like and so i think 
you know, because I can't answer this question and not flip it on as positive. I'm so sorry, Melanie. <laughs> I just think we have an opportunity. We just have an opportunity. And so why, what is at stake? Everything. What is possible? Everything. Everything. Everything's possible right now. We can change the world, man. And it's not like, where it's not the Maki Dada hold hands and sing Kumbaya thing. It's like, if we genuinely decide that we're going to, we're going to center our ecology, as you put it, then everything is possible. Shane, I'm in. Thank you, Jen. I think it's quite obvious that y'all are my kind of tribe. So it's a glass half full tribe. <laughs> so thank you for the spin. Jumani, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, Jen really dropped the mic for us both, you know, I would say. But yeah, I mean, just to add on, you know, if we don't center environmental justice, climate justice, you know, we can see yeah, more premature death, you know, of our people, of our land, of our soils. Um, for so many communities, you know, the the impending doom has landed a long time ago, right? Um, for, you know, if we look at the drought in Libya or the flooding in Pakistan or on Pacific Islands or for unhoused folks, any major storm, you know, puts them at risk of losing everything. Um, and so, yeah, like if we don't organize ourselves around the sustainability of the earth for future generations, we can see more of that sooner and sooner to come. Um, and as Jen said, you know, I mean, everything is possible, right? Um, but it really takes releasing so much of the modernity that we strive for, right? Um, and really going back to our ancestral land-based practices that sustained, you know, ecological systems for many, many, many generations before us. I mean, climate change has always happened, right? The earth runs its cycles, but the acceleration of it you know, is happening in this way for the first time um, in human history. And so th there's not like anything we can do so that human beings live forever, right? Um, but if we want more time with the earth, um, then we have to release our idea of, you know, this version of modernity that has been provided to us is what's going to make us happy. It's what's going to help us survive. Um, because it's not, you know, the, clo the closer we get to technological advancements, <laughs> the closer we get to the premature death of all of life. <laughs> um, and so really just holding that, that contradiction, you know, and resisting it. I really want to lift up something you're saying here, Jamani, of this, the, the modernity, like to live this modern life. Yesterday, I was contemplating a question that was asked, like, do you want to be comfortable or do you want to live in luxury? Now, for all my Tauruses in the audience, maybe you also are attracted to a little luxury. Not all of the activists and organizers don't like nice things. You know what I mean? Like, I, nice, I like the nice stuff of life. I do. Like, well, capitalism, there's a lot of contradictions. We're full of them. But I had to really think about this yesterday about moderation and prudence, meaning like careful planning for the future. And that the more moderate, I can live a comfortable life. I can be good. And by being moderate, it's not only for myself, but it's my impact on all those around me. So with everything that I buy or every uh, dollar I spend or every drive I take, that it has an impact on another being, physical being, like a human being, an animal, a plant, everything I do, if I'm deciding to live luxuriously and like fly a private jet, I'm going to have a real impact on the planet and its people and its animals and its life, right? And so I just kind of wanted to to talk about that because I think that there's 
just lift up what you said, this idea of living in a modern way, especially our people. I don't think we talk about it enough in activism circles. Like our people are about the bag, like period. Our people are about like luxury, period. Our people are about the the finer things of life in mass. Like our music's about that, our television shows, movies, like this is like what our people are really focused on. And how do we move towards a more moderate way of living and thinking in terms of, I think if you activate what's natural in us, Shane, you've been talking about it, right? You can activate that which is a part of us. All of us intrinsically, we wanna care for one another. It's just in our blood. Like we are not destructive people. We wanna love and care for each other. We want to treat one another like family. And if we can see how we're impacting one another with our choices for the luxury, maybe we'll be more moderate. Just wanna add that little thing. Brianna, do you wanna talk a little bit? Oh, go ahead, Jen. I think that um, it's important that the way that we, it's not either or, right? Like we can have a really abundant and luxurious life in a way that is in harmony with the planet. And if we center that idea and we go, well, I don't want to give up looking fly, eating the best food, experiencing the best that's in the world, how can I do that in a way that is going to be generative, that's going to be good to the world, not just not have a negative impact, but how can I do it in a way that's in harmony with the world? I think we have to ask ourselves questions that inspire uh, us to create new ways of being, right? Because I too like the finer things in life. Um, but the way that I define the finer things in life might be a little bit different than other people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is fine to me is having a really incredible well-cooked meal with my family. What is mm -hmm. fine to me, what is what is luxury to me is having access to the land and, and to be able to see the stars. Last night, there were stars in Los Angeles. I mean, I guess they're always there, but I don't ever see them, right? Because, you know, but I went outside and I was like, this, this here, standing outside with my family and being in the dark and, and, and enjoying my family and having a nice glass of wine, right? That is a luxury to me, and I think that it's it's it shouldn't be. Um, we should not beat ourselves up for the idea that we want to have really beautiful, luscious life experiences. We just have to do it in such a way that I don't even think has to be moderate. I want that every day, every night, all the time all the time. I want to enjoy luscious, beautiful, sexy, fun time all the time. So how are we going to do that in a way that that means that we're all thriving? I just want to center that. Yeah, I think that that's, that's the portion, the end, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I live in excess and it takes from my neighbor, mm -hmm. if my luxury in, in, it impacts my neighbor and now they have to live with less, because I'm living in excess. Do y'all look at like your um, water bill and gas bill? I'll be looking at like my my usage versus my neighbor's usage. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> why am I? I mean, there's a lot of people here we hear all day, but like, how am I impacting? I agree. Live your best life. I came here to live a good life. I want to enjoy myself. But I also think what's really important, Jen, is what you're saying. Like, real basic to me is do harm to none. I can live my best life as long as I'm doing harm to none. And hopefully ensuring that others can live their best life as well, right? That there's something equitable in it. Brianna, did you wanna add? Yeah, I just wanted to um, express appreciation for how this conversation isn't just focusing on the future, but like the present effects of environmental inequity on us now. And um, I think as has been lifted up, the impacts on our health. Um, and just to even circle back to the, the plenary conversation on reproductive health, you know, there's so many ways in which our environment and environmental racism impacts us as people of color physically, um, even to the point of the stress of, you know, being a Black 
woman living in Los Angeles where I have to travel three times longer to go to my preferred grocery store than a white woman with the same income in a different neighborhood, that creates a stress that contributes to my allostatic low so that when I gave birth to my son, I ended up having health complications, despite the fact that, you know, I had all of the qualifications that said that I shouldn't be uh, experiencing those health challenges. And that is just so much the norm for us, for people of color, for Black people, because of the impacts of racism and the way it shows up in our environment on us, from the higher rates of lead in our water in Watts and in Compton, to the fact that even when controlled for income, we're more likely to live next to an environmental hazard than other communities, to the fact that, you know, we have a predisposition to asthma, not because we are biologically born with that, but because we live next to toxic uses that contribute to the degradation of our air and ultimately our bodies. And so we, environmental justice isn't a future thing. It's a, it's a now thing. It's impacting our health now and um, not only our physical health, but the mental and physical. So I really appreciate um, what I was uplifted earlier about how the impacts of um, even in, in de independence, that is not connected to how we relate to each other also impacts our uh, health and, and mental health. And when all the research that shows on what really brings joy and what really brings happiness is actually relationships. So we can have all the material things, all of the, the best cars and everything that we want, but if we're not co connected, we're still not going to be happy. And so I think our sustainability and, and, and the future of, of our environment hinges on us recognizing that we are mutually interdependent um, and how to learn from that. And so I, I'm, as far as the thing that I'm hopeful for, I'm actually really excited about how the science community and others are looking back to nature to be able to learn more about ourselves. You brought up, Nani, the, the microbiology and the soil and scientists are literally studying microbiomes to understand the human microbiome because they're so similar. Like to just to show how interconnected we are, like literally they are studying soil to figure out how our bodies operate and work. It's just crazy to me. And so I think the more we recognize that connection, um, I think the greater we will value the environment as um, a, a, a huge factor on our health, not only in the future, but in the present. Thank you, Brianna. I actually, I have more to talk about, but y'all, we are at time. Um, I want to just end with everyone sharing one last word, one word, one single gift, environmental ecology word that you want to share. And I'll start with you, Jamani. Interdependence. Thank you. Interdependence. Jen? Fun. <laughs> Interdependence. Fun. Brianna? Belonging. Belonging. Thank you. Shane? Healing. Healing. And my word, of course, is love. Love, 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 love. Thank y'all. It was so good to meet you. I feel like we just had like lunch, <laughs> like we just ate a really good meal. And I look forward to crossing paths with you all again. I wanted to have some questions from the audience. It seems we've run out of time. So, you know, write the names down, go into the DMs, figure out what you need to Peace, y'all.